Are you tired of getting one clipped by controller players and close range fights? Wait, what? He was shooting me that whole time? Like, that has to be controller. Have you watched montages from pros completely shitting on people and thought, there's no way you're going to be able to do that? Guess what? Thanks to aim trainers like Kovacs and Aim Lab, you can absolutely train to become an aim demon. And by the end of this video, you're going to learn the approach to reactive tracking, the most difficult aim mechanic of them all. I'm incredibly excited for this one because I collaborated with Siba, who's one of the top reactive players in the aim community, to make this content the absolute best it can be. You don't want to miss a single second in this. This video. In the normal PSA, don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out my YouTube memberships if my content resonates with you. What makes reactive tracking so difficult is that it combines all the aim mechanics like tracking, target switching, static, plus it requires high levels of reading, reactivity, endurance, and muscle control. Training reactivity is very important for FPS games for a couple reasons. It dramatically builds your reading skills, which is essentially your ability to understand where targets will go next using primarily visual but also audio information. Most people have heard of visual reaction time or VRT. There's a latency between your eyes interpreting the physical world and translating it into electrical signals your brain can use, then engaging the motor activity and muscles to perform an action in response. Since reactivity challenges your reading skills to such a high degree, you learn how to react to visual information much more quickly, effectively reducing your VRT, and that's a good thing. I'm sure you noticed by now, but enemies move in FPS games, particularly in high tier PVP lobbies. Other players get very good at avoiding damage and sometimes have very complex movement and strafe patterns. By learning reactivity, you're teaching yourself how to respond to any possible strafe pattern instead of simply memorizing common ones like AD spam. Finally, a lot of the same components that are present in moving while aiming, also known as strafe aiming, are present in reactive tracking. Most of the time in FPS games, you aren't sitting still while firing so that you can avoid incoming damage. This along with recoil pushes your crosshair around. In the frequent microcorrections, you have to do in reactive scenarios will help you in these situations. The main difference with strafe aiming is you can use movement to adjust your crosshair. Like if you perfectly mirror a target, you never need to touch your crosshair. That leads into a topic called hand interdependence, which we won't be covering in this video. The number one reason why people struggle with this mechanic is because they can't keep up with the bot movement since they're flooded with sensory information and their hand-eye coordination is just not at that level yet, especially due to the reactivity features. And by reactivity, activity we mean a higher frequency of target changes and movement, usually across multiple dimensions like diagonal or further and closer to your point of view. This is mostly common in a higher time to kill games or TTK like arena FPS, rest in peace, or movement shooters like Apex. But this does not mean you should only train reactivity if you play these types of games. Reactivity helps you train above all your reading skills, which we'll talk about in detail later on, but also skills like microcorrecting, matching target velocity, and being smooth switching, and so on. So don't skimp on this if you play TAC FPS games like Valorant or CS. For settings, as Siba points out, these matter the least in reactive tracking. As long as you can see the bot and crosshair, you're good. Wait, what about depth perception? This might surprise you, but you don't actually receive visual data in 3D. Each of your eyes is projecting a 2D image that your brain then performs magical advanced calculations and comparisons to form a single 3D image. It does this with visual cues like motion and size, since faster moving objects and larger objects are typically closer. So while the common mantra is you need lines on walls to perceive depth. I've even said this myself. I now understand this is far less important than you might think. If it helps you, so be it. But the important thing is that you have binocular vision, meaning two eyes, and that you can see your targets moving. Your brain will handle the rest. There are a couple settings hacks worth mentioning that I've seen in the community people use to improve faster. First one being to turn off hit sounds entirely. This forces you to use your eyes alone to read bot movement and ensure crosshair accuracy. Your auditory reaction time is objectively faster than your visual. Approximately 33% faster. So the concept here is you're isolating visual reaction for improvement. The second is from a member of my Discord, Sev, who posted a lot of fantastic info on reactive practice and holds a lot of high scores in reactive scenarios. He suggests making the crosshair the same color as the bot target in your aim trainer. If you're someone who has a hard time overly relying on your crosshair for information, this can be very beneficial to force you to read movement. We'll talk about this in 
in-depth, but a huge part of reading is watching the target to get intel about where it's going to go next. Removing the crosshair, you're isolating that skill to practice. Matching the crosshair color to the bot versus simply removing the crosshair lets you see when you're off target. The last thing you can do is look at the settings on enemy bots to enable a feature which changes the color of the bot when you're not on target. So basically, if you're not hitting it, you're given very prominent visual feedback that you're missing. A word of caution with these strategies I just covered, when playing FPS games, you will be using every bit of information, including sound, to help you read properly. So if you choose to use these techniques, understand why you're doing it and what you expect it to help with instead of just mindlessly doing it to get high scores. For proper technique, this section is going to be quite dense and is almost entirely summarized from conversations with Siba. Why should you care about Siba? He is one of the best reactive trackers as of this video recording and is excellent at describing his approach with aiming. So you're effectively getting a pro level guide to improve at reactive tracking for free by watching this video. Probably the biggest misconception people have is they try to instantly flick to target changes in movement, like how they would treat flick target switching scenarios. There's a great aimer and major contributor in the aim community named ODB. He puts it this way. People start flicking in reactive heavy scenarios like close fast strafes invincible as a coping mechanism when it's too difficult for them. It's critical to be very deliberate and avoid spastic flicking in order to properly develop reading skills. Smoothness comes from good reading. This might sound unusual, but fundamentally you will perform reactive tracking the same way that you perform smooth tracking, which we covered in a previous video. Quick recap, smoothly reacting to bot changes in movement, minimizing tension, watching the bot versus crosshair, and avoiding prediction. Instead of discussing this in detail, we're now gonna go through the advanced topics specific to reactivity. But keep in mind throughout all of this, the fundamentals of smooth tracking. According to Siba, the core principle behind being good at reactivity is to minimize wasted time and energy as much as you possibly can. Know this, if you're ever unsure what your next step of improvement is, think about anything you're doing in your technique that is wasteful. Here's some key examples. Matching bot velocity. This is extremely important for increasing your damage uptime while your crosshair is on the target. A lot of times I notice people waste tons of points because they're simply going too fast or too slow based on the bot movement. And the best reactive trackers are excellent at matching velocity. Prioritize under aiming. It costs more energy to move your crosshair past a bot and then have to completely change velocity to bring it back. Instead, by under aiming, your momentum can carry into correcting the crosshair onto the bot. This might sound familiar because it's true with all sorts of aim mechanics, not just reactive tracking. Budgeting tension. This comes up a lot in conversations with me where players are trying not to be tense, which is a good practice, but they say they cannot avoid some amount of tension. So I think Siba put this concept wonderfully, and maybe this will resonate with with you. We strive to minimize tension as much as possible so it is available to us when we need it. Let me elaborate. Tension costs energy and endurance. Try visualizing your tension as a battery that drains as you consume it. Reactive scenarios in particular are very endurance heavy and intense, so you need to consciously think about minimizing tension not to completely avoid it, but to bring it to bear when you need it. You may have heard of edge tracking by reading Kraskse's guide for Bardos or Silky Crisp's video on getting GM and Voltaic. This is the concept of intentionally not matching the target's movement verbatim because you assume, for example, it's going to do rapid short strafes or change directions in a way you can predict. In those situations, it's more optimal to leave your crosshair in the center of the bot as it rapidly strafes or hug the edge of the bot in the direction you know it's going to change back to. So there's two schools of thought here, one being that edge tracking is good. maybe. Even even necessary to implement in specific aim situations since it is more efficient with your energy and crosshair placement. Snowy in particular has a run of air which is a very popular reactive scenario where he implements edge tracking effectively. Then there's the other school of thought where it's seen as a crutch that doesn't lead to developing good technique. Siba, ODB, and many other great aimers I respect do not recommend implementing edge tracking into your technique if your goal is to develop better mouse control and reading versus simply just getting high scores on a leaderboard. Instead they suggest to aim for center mass because you have no way of knowing which direction the bot will go next other than reading its movement, which we'll go into detail later on. Siba recommends keeping your arm hard locked to the bot center of mass, then slightly adjust with fingers and fingertip to stay on the center of mass. To summarize, I would suggest if you're newer to intermediate, to definitely focus on aiming for center of mass instead of trying to crutch edge tracking so you develop good technique foundations. If you're more advanced and you understand your context and goals, it might be worth pursuing as long as you're implementing it for the right reasons.
Visual reaction time. This comes up a lot in the AIM community, and now is as good a time as any to discuss it at a high level since this AIM mechanic will push your reaction abilities to their limit. We should briefly talk about the science here. Most people don't understand this, but your eyes are actually part of your brain. They just happen to sit outside of your cranium or skull. If you think of your brain's job as creating maps of your experience of the world, you can see why your eyesight and vision is so critical to everything you think, feel, and do. One of your eyes' primary jobs is to, like a camera, take visual information and convert it into electrical signals your brain understands. And this act alone has some amount of latency. Just like there's some latency with your computer processing inputs before rendering it on your monitor. Kind of weird to think about, right? Then there's additional latency when your brain sends signals to your muscles by way of motor neurons, which then actually engage the muscles to perform an action. This overall time period from seeing movement or stimulus and then process it into a behavior like clicking your mouse is called visual reaction time. In humans, the average reaction time is around 250 milliseconds, and most respectable research shows that this can be as low as two. 200 ms on average. It's important to note that VRT is not the same as a reflex. The difference? A reflex is hardwired into your biology and processes far quicker, like blinking if you get something in your eye. Your brain is built to protect your body from things that are vital for its processing, and your reflexes are automatic behaviors that don't require decision making. So logically, everyone assumes, well, lower reaction time is always better, and they'll even blame their lack of progress on genetics, because some people just have better VRT and there's nothing to be done there. This is just completely untrue, even in reactivity. Siebig goes so far as to say that VRT has literally nothing to do with being good at reactive tracking. How is that possible? Because if you're measuring VRT, you're using something like human benchmark that is incredibly simplified. When light turned green, click button. But in aiming, especially reactive tracking, the visual information you're getting is way more complex at a much higher speed and frequency than you're probably used to. So it takes a lot of extra processing to properly react to the visual information you're getting. The bottleneck is almost never in your raw ability to turn visual information into electric signals, but understanding what decisions to make with the information you're getting, which is your reading skills. This is why it's so important to think of everything in concert, your vision, your reading, your reaction, your engagement of muscle, force applied to mouse, all holistically. In this section, we'll talk about a continuum of play styles to help you better understand how to incorporate elements of other people's play styles to make your own unique style based on your strengths and weaknesses. The way Siba describes this, there are two extremes of reactivity, snappy and smooth. We'll talk about the extremes on each side, but most people will sit somewhere on a continuum between the two. Case studies we'll discuss on extremes are top players who consistently place in the top spots in various aim competitions and tournaments. Mad Badman, for example, earned 50,000 in tournaments over a period of three months. So these are excellent examples of aim to base our learning. On the smooth side, you have players like Skooky and Snowy. This is where most people will gravitate and the priority here is to maximize uptime on target by focusing on minimizing jitter and smoothly reacting to bot changes in movement. On the snappy side, you have MBM, or Mad Badman, who most famously has stated that he doesn't believe in reading bot movement. This playstyle is about avoiding time off target and will look very jittery to the point where it looks like poor reading skills. This is a far riskier playstyle because it could result in a lot more tension and wrist usage, which can lead to tendonitis and other health problems. We'll go into more detail detail about that later on. MBM himself is often out of commission due to wrist injuries, so being aware of your body's needs and limits will be very important if you invest time on this end of the continuum. So on finding your play style, a big mistake most people make is trying to replicate another player's performance or external characteristics like their grip, sensitivity, and equipment. Understand there are different environmental, physiological, and even mental factors which will be unique to each player. So while there will be some emerging trends, it doesn't mean you can just copy another player and get the same performance. Siba talks about how he has a wrist tremor and it affects the playstyle he's built. As a result of knowing his specific strengths and weaknesses, he grips the mouse at an angle where he's able to properly move it using his pinky and thumb. If he held it at a different angle, he wouldn't be able to do this, but you, just looking at his VODs and copying that, won't result in the same outcomes. It's not like he sat down and thought about every possible grip and selected the most optimal one based on his characteristics. It's just something that he developed over time, which will be the same with you. It's more important to minimize your weaknesses, minimize waste, and optimize your strengths based on factors which will be unique to you. This is what all the great players do.
Going back to Siba, he consciously thinks if he's using his wrist too much and adjusting a few times to properly use his arm. Consider that your tendons are like rubber bands and that they are meant to stretch, but doing it too much can cause them to wear. You can also become overly stiff if you're not properly stretching or doing exercises to increase your endurance and dexterity. I'm not a physician, but I do highly recommend checking out 1HP's channel. They have excellent wrist and arm stretching guides. Another thing you can do is use light weights and perform wrist recovery or endurance exercises. Exercises. These are extremely useful because they cover all the different ranges of motion you'll be hitting when training intensively, and developing more strength and flexibility in your mouse hand will give you more access to ranges of motion and give you more mouse control overall. It's also very important to consider using all parts of your arm when performing the techniques. One easy way to automate this is something I got from Gord, who is an excellent aim coach by the way. You can try running a shorter routine at half your sends range, then your sends range, and then double your sends range, and actively think about using the parts of your arm like your wrist fingertip shoulder that you don't normally use as much in order to isolate training those different muscle groups now you're probably thinking why do i need to exercise and stretch to play a video game well technically you don't i'm not your dad but just like with sports if you get injured you can be out of commission for a very long time especially if you don't allow proper time for recovery i've seen this happen dozens of times just in the past couple years with promising players who are quite young so don't think you're immune just because of your age i don't want to make this a whole ass video about posture and ergonomics so the key thing here is just listen to your body try to keep things neutral and make adjustments if you're experiencing pain but also don't overthink this as Lighthawk says who is an actual physical therapist as long as you aren't having problems with range of motion or nerves or pain then any way you want to hold the mouse is fine when training reactivity I would highly suggest using an incremental learning method which is essential if you're over 25 but younger players can do this too why 25 because that's around the time your brain becomes less plastic, meaning it is more difficult to change, particularly major changes all at once. So instead, what you want to do is have shorter, more intense training periods, anywhere from 7 to 30 minutes, where you're trying overly difficult scenarios and generating lots of errors to the point of frustration. It's very important to keep trying even when you're getting frustrated, because that's signaling your brain something needs to change. In other words, you need to learn. Take random quick mini breaks of about 10 seconds during this intense part of your training. If you're new to intermediate, try to focus on one thing that you notice you're doing wrong and want to improve. It doesn't even have to be complex. It could be as simple as noticing that your crosshair is slightly dragging behind the bot movement and work on trying to do that thing correctly. This process minimizes the complexity of the overall task and it helps your brain identify what needs to improve. Because reactivity involves so many factors happening simultaneously, this is extremely important so you don't get overwhelmed and train effectively. After your 7 to 30 minute intense session, pick a break if you need, then you can transition into easier reactive scenarios or even some smooth track scenarios for as long as you are focused and alert, which for most people tapers off around 90 minutes of consecutive training. If you're older than 25, that will probably be the only intense learning bout that you can handle for the day. But if you're younger, you can take a break to refresh, look out at a horizon distance, give your eyes a rest, and launch into another intense reactive training session. How many of these training loops you can handle in a day? Day will be completely up to you, but I would highly suggest not continuing if you are no longer focused and alert. Your brain needs time to rest in order to consolidate the information that you're learning. This section is mostly going to be Siba's explanation to me on how he reads bot movement. The first thing is, learn to move the mouse with an equal amount of force in every axis. This is something I notice most people miss, and it goes back to the muscle control we spoke about. It's very important to be able to hit all angles with as much skill equity as you can muster because reactive targets are going to move the most erratically and you need to be able to keep up with them. Next, you want to pay attention to the way the target is moving, how fast it's moving, what axes, and think about how it might move in the immediate future. Aim in a way that would be advantageous if it moves in that manner. Although this kind of sounds like predicting, it's based on your ability to monitor bot movement. You want to prepare for where the bot will go next based on how it's currently moving, but not by memorizing its patterns. This is a big one. If you notice the bot is decelerating, you know it's going to move in the other direction once it stops decelerating. The best reactive trackers deeply understand this and are able to tell when targets are going to change direction because of how they're decelerating and they understand the physics of movement. Last thing is when dealing with accelerating or blink type targets, you're able to properly read them by just staying on center of mass well enough. So if you struggle with the blink and Fugla XYZ or Ground Plaza, for example, try focusing more on staying center mass and smoothly reacting to the blink 
planks instead of doing really hard snaps. Sometimes people struggle with just the eye part of reading, like your eye muscles and focusing, so you can do some visual training exercises in this case. My research shows here that it's most beneficial for people who have impairments or injuries. But if you have the time and dedication, you can certainly do these. I'll provide some links in the description of videos you can use to train these, and you can just do each of the exercises two to three times a week for two to three minutes at a time with a rest period afterwards. Smooth Pursuit. This is your ability to track a target in motion. Simply watch the target in the video without moving your head. Near far, this exercises your eye's ability to perform accommodation, which is where your eye maintains a clear image or focus as distance changes. You can just switch your gaze between a close object about a, a foot away and a far object a few feet away, and then just do that back and forth. Saccades, this is your eye's ability to abruptly change the point of fixation in a rapid manner. In the video, try to fixate upon the target as they appear on screen as quickly as you can. For scenario types, the good news is reactive scenarios are essentially just faster versions of smooth tracking scenarios with higher frequency of change. So still the one dimension like X or Y, two dimension X and Y, and three dimensions X, Y, and Z. There are a couple of key features of bots in this category we're going to review. Instant acceleration or blink. These are bots that either quickly ramp up in their velocity to the point that they're going, or they just basically teleport. These are good because they force you to not crutch on prediction. It's readable, but completely unpredictable. Old reaction maps like RTH are predictable for the strafe profiles because they have very defined minimum and maximum strafe lengths. VSS, these are some of my favorite types to train with because they feature strafe acceleration that frequently changes, so it becomes far more difficult for you to predict or memorize bot patterns, which is fantastic for reasons that are hopefully obvious by now. Gauntlet and AIO, two of the most popular reacted types out there, Air and Ground Plaza, are in a gauntlet style, meaning there's eight separate rounds of bots that you have to kill before moving moving on to the next, and each bot has a different strafe pattern. That makes the tasks run really long sometimes, so thankfully these have fallen out of favor. People then started developing AIO or all-in-one, which puts all the separate bot profiles in the gauntlet into one bot, but that introduces a lot of RNG. Revisect most notably moved toward one minute gauntlets with multiple bots that just time out after 14 seconds, and it's all about maximizing your score while they're up. Voltaic recently updated their benches to use similar types, and I'd really suggest not training on gauntlet scenarios unless you like playing them, just because they tend to prioritize getting good runs on each bot versus developing technique, and really they just take too damn long to play. As we're reviewing, it's important to note we'll be prioritizing sends that don't reward prediction based on their bot patterns or bot size, so there may be some scenarios we exclude even though they're reactive, because they're easy to game. There's a complete list of the AimLab and Kovac scenarios Voltaic and Revisect have made, I'll include in the description below, and also check out the Jamboard I put together. X or Y, meaning primarily one dimension like horizontal or vertical movement, is the most simplified and uncommon bot type. I suggest people start here when first getting into reactivity because it's far easier to read the movement. By far the most common scenario type in aim trainers are the fast strafes types, and there are tons of variants. Close, far, long, low ground, high ground, gauntlet, slow, mid range, VSS, easy, kind of close, and so on. The first experience most players will have is with close fast strafes invincible, or CFSI for short. This was even featured in Aimer 7's original guide on aim training as the scenario to play to show you how you get flooded with bot movement. Even though this does have some movement toward your FOV, I still include it in the X or Y category because once it gets close to your FOV, it mostly stays there and just strafes horizontally. There are so many fast strafe scenarios that it would be impossible to go through them all. I'll show on screen some of the best to play for both Kovacs and AimLab. In general, look for VSS and mid-range type scenarios as they're the most likely to have varied strafe patterns that focus on one plane only. You won't find a lot in the vertical only category since vertical reactivity does doesn't show up much in FPS games, but I still find them useful to train on, particularly when starting out to get used to the axis. Last thing I'll mention is Track Stop, aka Pause Track in Aim Lab, is really good to help train reading by forcing you to understand that slowing down doesn't automatically mean the target will change direction immediately after. Most FPS games have physics where decelerating means that the enemy is going to change direction. So I wouldn't worry about getting good scores on this one, it's just good to mix in so you don't get too comfortable with the idea that slowing momentum always means the target will move in the opposite direction. Next is XY, so now we're moving into targets with more complex movement across two planes. This category is where players should spend most
most of their time before graduating into XYZ. The most known in this category is Ground Plaza, which thankfully is no longer a gauntlet only scenario. There are quite a few high quality scenarios in this category, such as RA Strafe Track, RA MPC Track, VT Pill Track, and Aim Lab, and Ground Varied, Smooth Thin Strafe Raspberry, and Unpredictable Strafes and Kovacs. For the one wall reactive types, Asu shows up again. This Pasu Track ADHD and Kovacs, and in Aim Lab, you've got Smooth Track Reactive, RA Air Track, and RA Air Sphere. I really think the Reva Sect one wall reactive scenarios are great training, and you don't see the same scenarios in Kovacs, though even if you have Kovacs, I think it's worth training these in Aim Lab as well. Finally, for the vertical only reactive, you've got overhead jump hard in Kovacs. Again, this is a really niche situation, so there's not a lot of tasks in this area. Lastly, the most complex types are XYZ, which means the targets can move in all dimensions. Probably the most known scenario in all of aim training is air, which people either learn to love or just hate it forever. The very original was in a gauntlet form and had UFOs and skybots, which were notoriously difficult to hit and ruined runs, so most people moved on to air nuns or air no UFOs, no skybots. Air nuns is still a great scenario to train on, but in my opinion, if you're just getting into things, there's better scenarios available such as air varied and fugla XYZ and Kovacs. In aim lab, you've got tasks like RA reactive sphere, VT sphere track, and VT blink track. When dealing with blinking bots like in fugla XYZ, remember what we discussed in reading about keeping your crosshair in the center of the bot. Also, when flicking to a bot that blinks, try to avoid a super snappy flick like you would in Flick TS. Instead, try to remain smooth with minimal tension. LDDH is worth mentioning. It's one of my favorite scenarios of all time. It is sort of between XY and XYZ, but I love it because of the random erratic, almost laggy movement it features. I wish there was a version in Aim Lab, but I couldn't find one. Finally, there's the three-dimensional pass-through types, such as Precision XYZ, also known as Packy Aim. Raspberry also made some incredibly difficult versions in this category, such as VSFSI Raspberry. And then there's the highly difficult Air UFO Hard, which is literally just the UFO bot in air. I like training Precision XYZ because of the major differences in tracking when the bot is very close to you versus when it's further away. And it has some big diagonal swings that you need to track. For routines, there's not a lot of reactive routines out there, so I made one for each axis group using the best scenarios described in the previous section. I made three routines for both Aim Lab and Kovacs, so check the description below for share codes and links. Quick reminder for playlists and Kovacs, you can just copy the share code and paste it into the share code box under online playlists. For Aim Lab, the easiest way is just to open the direct links in my YouTube description below. That will open the routine directly and start playing it immediately. You can also just open the workshop ID I listed and subscribe to the playlist. Then you'll see it permanently listed in your custom playlist inside Aim Lab. My concept with the routines was to limit the number of scenarios to seven and allow you to decide if you want to run the hard reactive tasks anywhere between seven and 30 minutes. You can just edit the number of times they run in order to determine how long the playlist will be. Then I follow them up with some smoothness or less reactive sense for the remainder of the training session. The idea is to help people incrementally isolate the axes to improve on, then progressively move on to more complex scenarios. One thing to note is I picked quite a few scenarios that have a lot of RNG. So don't worry too much about your scores as a metric for your progress. Focus on developing the technique we've discussed in this video. And if you want some variety, or if you're already really skilled in reactive tracking, here's some other routines to try. Crask C one by one. This is on the highly difficult side, picking lots of scenarios made by Raspberry, who is an excellent map maker. Eerie Cold Track. This is the latest Eerie Cold routine for tracking. It has more than just reactive scenarios in it, but it's just an excellent routine overall. Mad Badman Track. This is a little old and centered around more than just reactivity, but has a lot of solid scenarios. And then Sev Routines. There's four routines in the description made by someone in my Discord community. And now for troubleshooting. Over Flicking. We mentioned this earlier in the video, but the main thing to do here is actively think about under flicking instead. I know that sounds like common sense, but it can be extremely useful to notice and cue attention to what you're doing wrong so your brain knows that thing needs to change. Also consider if you're being overly tense, snapping too hard, and thinking about it more like decelerating and accelerating to match the bot velocity. Over predicting. We talked about this in the smooth tracking VOD. Avoid it by assuming the bot will go in the same direction forever and make yourself read and react to movement. Instead, let's talk a little bit about the difference between reading and predicting. I see this where people think that they're predicting because they watch the bot slow down near the end of the strafe, indicating it will change directions and preemptively start to decelerate to react to the movement. This isn't predicting. This is actually reading and it's what you want as we discussed in the reading section. So make sure to reward yourself internally when you do this versus predicting because that's the behavior you want to reinforce. If scenarios feel too hard, time scale down to reduce the bot speed. This isn't available in Aim Lab, so look for easy or medium versions of the scenarios, which might be called something like iron, silver, bronze, if made by Voltaic. Try to avoid making the technique easier for you by choosing scenarios with larger 
larger targets, because then it becomes easier to rely on prediction in order to get high scores. Forgetting the smoothness fundamentals. As we said at the beginning of the video, reactivity is inherently the same as smooth tracking. That's why it's so important to intermittently train on smooth scenarios like smooth and strafes while you're training reactivity. Then you don't develop habits like spaz flicking, which might help you get better reactive scores, but inhibit your aim technique overall. This is more for the intermediate to advanced players training on bad reactive scenarios. If the scenarios are predictable due to strafe profiles because they have very defined minimum and maximum strafe lengths, or if bots only blink in the direction they were moving, it's a bad map. A good example of this is Flickr Plaza and Kovax and RTH and Aim Lab. One of the best ways to practice reactivity is to get into some LG 1v1 duels, especially if you're doing a vamp version which has health steals so the fights last much longer. If you don't know what LG 1v1 duels are, it's from OG Quake Lightning Gun, which is a close range continuous DPS tracking gun. Keep in mind this will be very endurance heavy, so take breaks when you need. It's a lot harder to find people to play with in games like Diabotical or Quake Champions because nobody really plays those games, but you can also find custom games in Overwatch for example so you're not forced to load up a shooter from the 90s to do this. Thanks for sticking around if you made it through this whole video. This is an extremely dense topic because it involves all aspects of aim mechanics, but I really try to keep it super focused. This video has been a labor of love. I've learned so much along the way, so I hope it's helped you, and I appreciate everyone who supported me along the way. We'll still be doing the commentary follow-up, so make sure to post your questions in the comments. So until then, I bid you farewell.